Welcome back to the Foreign International. President Trump signed a partial trade deal with China as the world's two largest economies try to contain an economic uh, struggle. Through the deal, the Trump administration aims to resolve some long-standing American concerns about Chinese trade abuses. However, the accord appears to leave questions about how Washington and Beijing will enforce its terms and prevent further tensions. The deal takes steps to root out several practices that um, irked the White House and bipartisan members of Congress, including intellectual property theft and forced technology transfers in exchange for Chinese market access. According to the text released by the White House, it also details a $200 billion increase in Chinese purchases of U.S. goods over two years, a priority for President Trump, no doubt about it. Uh, the president said the U.S. and China are righting the, ro the, the wrongs of the past and delivering a future of economic justice and security for American workers, farmers and families. He added that the deal has total and full enforceability. I just wanted to show you very quickly the reaction of the markets. I wanted to point out that there isn't a huge reaction because we, we of course, we knew about the signing for a very long time ago. So far, S&P 500 is two tenths of a percent higher. Uh, Dow as well, four tenths of a percent higher, 29,052 points. And Nasdaq composite, quarter of a percent higher, 9,274 points. In terms of fixed income, uh, the U.S. 10-year treasury is yielding 1.79, the two-year 1.56, and the three-month 1.57. Very interesting movements of the dollar index, which is trading lower this evening at the 97 mark, down by almost quarter of a percent. Uh, well, that's a very interesting because we saw a few days of an increasing dollar index, euro dollar rallies almost three tenths of a percent, and the sterling against the dollar 0.14 percent in the green territory. Uh, so as we can see, a lower dollar index this evening. We're going to be back on the markets, of course, and we're going to analyze um, each and every one of the financials and the retail sector that is. Uh, under pressure after uh, what happened with Target. We're going to talk about it, but uh, this segment we're going to uh, dedicate to the democratic debate, of course, the trade deal between uh, the United States and China, uh, and of course, the tensions in the Middle East. I want to start uh, with the democratic debate, the last one. Uh, six democratic presidential contenders took um, the stage for the final time before nominating uh, contest starts and tensions cracked through a field that has resisted attacks for much of the of the primary race. The contenders first faced questions about their credentials to handle the rising specter of war in the Middle East following the U.S. killing of Iran's top general Qasem Soleimani earlier this month. Uh, Sanders defended his decision as a House member to vote for a military force authorization in Afghanistan and again attempted to distance his record on Iraq from Biden's. I took the floor. I did everything I could to prevent that war. Uh, Joe saw it differently, uh, said Biden. Uh, Klobuchar asked whether he would remove forces from the Middle East, said he would uh, she would leave some troops there. Warren on the other side contended that we need to get our combat troops out. But the guy, an Afghanistan war veteran, criticized the president for sending more troops to the region. Biden, when asked the same question, said he would leave troops in the Middle East if he became president, adding that we are in a position where we are going to have to pull our forces out because of the U.S. decision to kill Soleimani. Frankly, I think President Trump uh, flat out lied about a reason the president authorized the strike, Biden said. Uh, they also, of course, expressed their uh, opinion on trade and foreign policy. Progressive rivals uh, Warren and Sanders part over their trade policy, while most Democrats vying to defeat Trump have criticized his protectionist trade policies and trade war with China. Warren and Sanders have said they are open to using tariffs in some ways. And of course, they said the trade deal, the, the phase one trade deal, the trade truce between the United States and China is definitely not sufficient uh, sufficient to uh, benefit uh, the U.S. economy. And some of them also criticized the USMCA 
um, the free trade agreement, the North American free trade agreement. Uh, so it's been extremely interesting. One, it's also interesting what kind of a place uh, Mike Bloomberg is going to have since he skipped the primaries. But in order to go ahead, uh, let me bring to the show Alan Friedman, American author and journalist. Good evening, Alan. And thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Pleasure to be with you. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on this um, last uh, Democratic debate before, of course, uh, the nominating contest starts? Well, let's try to put the American political story in context. Uh, the phase one China trade agreement um, signed today is not a step that's very important, nor is it very credible. Some of the promises by China to buy more U.S. agricultural goods, for example, are just promises, and they don't really have an enforceability. Basically, most American economists believe that the phase one China deal that Trump announced was a political stunt. He did it because he understood he needed to do something before the election and couldn't let the whole China issue go for another year. And he wanted to make believe he could claim victory. But the reality is that he has just brought America and China back to where we were two years ago before he started the trade war, and America has lost many billions, and U.S. farmers are in trouble. So let's put that in context. The second thing is that the U.S. debate last night between six Democratic candidates definitely saw Elizabeth Warren come out as the strongest debater. Elizabeth Warren, you'll remember, is the most left-of-center Senate Democrat, and she and Bernie Sanders are in competition for the extreme left part of the party, not the moderate part. Joe Biden did okay, and he's still, in many parts of America, the number one candidate. So Donald Trump, even though he's facing an impeachment trial in the Senate next week, is continuing to uh, try to attack Biden as the most probable candidate using Russian Putin uh, propaganda repeating the lies of the KGB and the FSB that uh, Ukraine really interfered in 2016, it wasn't Russia, and that the Biden son is guilty of something which he's not. And Trump is using this against Biden because he sees Biden as the strongest Democrat. Even though Elizabeth Warren is ahead in Iowa and Pete Buttigieg are doing well, the probability is now more Biden, and Trump definitely uh, fears Biden more than the others. Having said that, I've been in America for the last few weeks talking to many people in Washington and around the country, and my feeling is that right now it looks to me that impeachment or no impeachment, with an economy growing at 2% probably in 2020, Trump will probably be re-elected. And um, where is Mike Bloomberg in, in the whole situation, in the whole picture, in your opinion? Nowhere. Do you have he has Nowhere. any chances? No. Mike Bloomberg is an old white man in his 70s, a billionaire, who spent $200 million already in the last uh, few weeks and probably doesn't even have 2% of the national polling. No. Mike Bloomberg is a good guy. He was a very good mayor of New York. He's a nice guy. Uh, he's worth $55 billion, so he's a rich guy. But America is getting sick of old white men billionaires, and I don't think that after Trump they'll elect another billionaire. Um, and Mike Bloomberg is not popular. Joe Biden is up at 20 percent. Mike Bloomberg is at 2 percent. So, uh, no, I don't see Mike Bloomberg as doing much except spending a lot of money. Well, certainly, um, that's very interesting. Um, I was wondering, since foreign policy and in particular the, the trade truce, the phase one trade deal uh, between the US and China and the signing today that was pretty expected and long awaited uh, was um, a very much of a topic yesterday. What are your thoughts on the, on the signing that we saw today? And of course, um, President Trump, who highlighted uh, the great performance of the U.S. economy and the record low unemployment rate. Well, I said this a few minutes ago, but I'll be happy to repeat it. The U.S.-China phase one trade deal is not a big deal. It was discounted by the market and by investors. It does not represent any significant progress. It does not resolve the problem of counterfeiting or intellectual property. 
it will not result in the kind of promised U.S. agricultural exports that Trump has been promising farmers who are hard hit by the tariffs. So it's basically a campaign stunt by Trump to try to put the China talks on hold for a year, get through the election, hope to be reelected, and then start again. In terms of economic values, the United States and China were like this two years ago. Then Trump started the trade war. Now the United States is below, has lost billions because of the trade war. China has been hurt as well. But what we go back to with this phase one agreement is basically where we were two years ago before Trump started the trade war. So if Trump had not started the trade war, we would have the same results of phase one, maybe a little better. You see what I mean? Uh, certainly, uh, I mean that's that's very interesting. And, and do you think it's it's a it's a milestone for for Trump from political point of view and as a, as an image? I mean, or at least um, ahead of the nation and the farmers. No, I think the farmers are still angry, and some will vote Democrat because they don't believe Trump's promises. And the phony deal that Trump announced today is not a serious deal and does not resolve problems. It just calls a truce. So in economic terms, the phase one agreement takes us backwards to where we were two years ago because we've gone down in trade terms since Trump started the trade war. And so all the phase one deal does is it recovers a little bit of lost ground that Trump himself surrendered. In terms of the political impact, Trump's uh, voters are generally people who watch Fox News in America. And they're not really educated enough to even understand what an international trade deal is. So, no, it doesn't matter to those voters. What matters to them is Trump screaming and shouting and lying and doing it on Fox News. Because Trump owns 40 to 45 percent of the American voters. Fox News, the state propaganda machine for the White House, really, really does a good job of propaganda for Trump. Even though he's not a very successful president, and he's a very corrupt president, and he's been impeached, and he's going on trial in the Senate, uh, he still says the economy is great. And a lot of Americans, by the way, are happy to vote for Trump again because they don't care about everything else. If the economy goes at 2%, the bottom line is Americans will probably re-elect Trump. They don't care if he's racist. They don't care if he assassinates an Iranian. They don't care if he starts a small war. They don't care about anything except if the economy is going along at two percent, and that's probably reality. Uh, I just wanted to touch upon another um, extremely interesting topic for us, and this is, of course, the tensions in the Middle East. For instance, today, in an angry speech on state television, Iranian uh, President Hassan Rouhani lashed out at the U.S. and Europe uh, for its uh, presence in the Middle East and for, for what he described as the latter's failures in uh, upholding the 2015 Iranian nuclear deal. U.S. troops are insecure in the region today and EU troops might be in danger tomorrow. This is according to translation, of course, uh, what uh, Rouhani said. Uh, personally, uh, do you believe Iran is capable of retaliation or capable of any, um, how can I say, sufficient response of the killing of Qasim Soleimani? Well, as I've explained in recent days in articles and on television around the world, the issue of Iran is an issue of Trump assassinating the second most powerful government official of Iran, Soleimani, in order to distract American domestic attention away from impeachment. And if you ask, could somebody be so evil that they would kill people, bomb people, let a, create chaos, let a, a Ukrainian jet be shot down, losing 176 lives, all just to distract attention from impeachment? The answer is, unfortunately, that's Donald Trump. Now, since Donald Trump escalated with the assassination uh, and began threatening war crimes, like we will destroy Iran's cultural sites, Clearly, the situation got out of hand. Remember, it was Donald Trump who tore up the 2015 nuclear accord, who walked away from it last year. It was Donald Trump and John Bolton, his 
national security advisor who really want a war with Iran. They want to have uh, a clash with Iran because they want regime change in Iran. But at the same time, there's an interesting other dynamic going on, and that is that in Iran, middle classes, the normal Iranians, are beginning to rebel against their own government exactly. because of the shooting down of the 176 passengers in the Ukraine jet. Well, that because was Iranians, pretty much of a mistake. I mean, well, we now learn that there were orders given by the Revolutionary Guards to shoot down any planes over the Tehran city area. So half mistake and half really big mistake. But the point of this is that clearly the economic sanctions on Iran by the U.S., together with the problem of the oil market, have meant that Iran is not able to provide the Iranian population with basic educational and hospital services. They're not providing the basic services of government. And so the Iranian people are against their own government. If Donald Trump had not interfered, there'd probably be a better chance of real regime change. Now we have a messy situation in which the result will probably be that Vladimir Putin and Erdogan of Turkey and Iran, those three countries, will become the key influencing countries in the Middle East. Not America, not Europe, Iran, um, Turkey, and Russia. Because what Donald Trump is creating, as he withdrew the troops from American troops from Syria and let Russian troops move in, and as he let Turkey's Erdogan kill Kurds in, in Iraq and Syria, what Donald Trump is basically doing is withdrawing from the Middle East, saying, okay, Putin, okay, you guys handle it, and putting up a big front against Iran on the way out. But the Iraqi government has asked... And the parliament has asked America to withdraw its troops. And the best response Donald Trump could come up with last week in a tweet was to say, if you kick us out of Iraq, we will freeze and steal billions of dollars of oil revenues that Iraq keeps at the New York Federal Reserve and freeze your account. That's not civil. And that's not uh, the way we used to be in America. That's Donald Trump. So basically, the bottom line of Iran is... America and Iran have struggled for 40 years of conflict since the original hostages were taken in 1979. Today, Donald Trump is making a mess of Iran, a mess of the Middle East, and he's allied with Saudi Arabia. He likes Israel and Saudi Arabia. Those are his two favorite countries. A dictatorship in Saudi Arabia and his friend Netanyahu, who's under corruption charges. And um, talking about Russia, we have an extremely interesting story coming uh, from Russia today. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev announced his and his government's resignation after President Vladimir Putin suggested changing the way the Prime Minister and government are chosen. Uh, Mr. Medvedev will stay on as Prime Minister until the new government is formed. Mr. Putin um, confirmed on a state television. He added that Mr. Medvedev would be offered the newly created post of Deputy Chairman of Russia's Security Council. The announcement was made after Mr. Putin's State of the Union address, during which he suggested a referendum that would give the country's parliament greater powers in confirming the prime minister uh, and the cabinet. Under these conditions, I believe it would be right for the government of the Russian uh, Federation to resign, according to Mr. Medvedev. And I just wanted to bring you the latest that Russian President Putin proposed constitutional changes that could set the stage for him to wield political power after his presidency ends as his longtime ally, Prime Minister Medvedev, unexpectedly uh, stepped down. Um, what is your comment on this story? Vladimir Putin is due to leave power, leave the presidency of Russia in 2024. Um, he's governed Russia for 20 years now. No one expects Vladimir Putin to give up power. He's not a Democrat. So as he's done in the past, when he reinforced the powers of the presidency and, and alternated himself between prime minister and president with Medvedev always being his deputy, even when he was above him, he's now changing the constitution again, uh, causing his government to resign and probably creating a more of a Chinese model where 
There is a high state council above the president, above the prime minister, and above the government. And he'll be that number one Tsar, with Medvedev as the number two. So I don't think Medvedev and the government were resigning because they were protesting. I think they were resigning because Putin told them to resign, and then he would take care of Medvedev. And I think this is all part of a plan for Putin to have himself continue in power for many, many years. And um, do you think this is going to have um, somehow negative impact, further negative impact uh, on, on the Russian economy? Putin is not managing the Russian economy very well right now, and he's, he's got a very bad economic situation because he hasn't really diversified beyond the energy sector, and he's very exposed as a commodity producer. Um, in terms of the economy, I think what he's trying to do now is probably print money and spend it on social and welfare programs to try to buy votes and buy electoral consensus and basically bribe the Russians with spending programs, which will create more deficit and more debt, uh, which will create more of a problem in the future. But he's not really worried about the economy. Putin is right now having the best time of his life. He interfered in the American election in 2016. The American CIA said that. He interfered in the 2020 election, just hacking last week the company Burisma, where Joe Biden's son was a board member. And you can be sure we'll be seeing something like that coming out in a few months during the campaign to help Trump. Putin is rewriting the geopolitical map in half of the Middle East, from Syria to Libya to Iran. So for Vladimir Putin, this is a wonderful time to be alive. He's winning the Middle East, he's taken over power from America, and he's enjoying himself. Why shouldn't he change the Constitution to make sure that he doesn't have to ever retire? All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your analysis and your thoughts, Alan Friedman, author and American journalist. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you, all the best. Well, I just wanted to show you very quickly um, the major averages so far. S&P 500 is two tenths of a percent higher, 3,289 points, very close to the tree. Three level Dow on the other side 29,054 uh, I mean that's that's really great performance of the Dow uh, um, four tenths of a percent higher but at the very beginning of the show I just wanted to remind you it was half a percent higher and Nasdaq composite two tenths of a percent higher 9,268 uh, points as we can see not really a great reaction of the markets it's just our guest said a few seconds ago any reaction of the markets because everything was this Discounted already the VIX index at the 12th level, and I shall tell you, stick around, guys, because up next is chart analysis.